I'm John McKee, editor of Messianic Apologetics. And on behalf of my parents, Mark and Margaret Huey, we would like to welcome you to this episode of the Outreach Israel Report. This week, we begin a new annual Torah cycle. And of course, what does the new Torah cycle start with? Bereshit, roughly Genesis chapters 1 through 6. And as any Bible reader should be aware, whether you are Jewish or Christian, Genesis 1 through 6 includes a great deal of information about the creation of the universe, the creation of our planet, and I would have to say most especially the creation of us as man and woman. So what are some of the things that you think about, talk about, discuss, and debate when we encounter Bereshit in the annual Torah cycle? I think it is fair to say that as we get closer and closer to the Messiah's return, and as the attacks on the veracity of Holy Scripture become more and more apparent, that the enemy is going to do his dead level best to pick apart the understanding and the convictions that many Bible believers have about the material contained in the first Torah reading. I don't know about you and the kinds of things that your local Messianic congregation or fellowship or Torah study or Bible study discuss when we get to a new cycle with Bereshit, but there are a number of significant questions that I would like to just put out there, some of which you might have been discussing this week, some of which you may have never thought of before. And are there any right answers? Are there any wrong answers? We're just here to get some discussions going and hopefully offer some points of view that you have heard, but perhaps you haven't heard uh, before. So we're going to begin with, for Pop, Mother, what are some of the main issues that jump out at you from Bereshit? Well, John, the very first verse, would you read it for us? Uh, yes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And the next one is? And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters, Genesis 1.2. Thank you. Well, those two verses I find most people overlook. And of course, I have had a lot of science. I'm a geologist. And actually those two verses I get a lot out of. And yet there's so much that isn't said. When it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. It doesn't say what timing was there. It doesn't say when that was. It doesn't say if it's just the earth or does it include the whole universe? There's a lot that is not there. So I have done a lot of research in this area and there are different, there's several different ways that people look at that. They see that as just before the six days of creation, six literal days. They also believe it to be a time that's not counted, but it's a vast amount of time where the earth was there, but not ready for a creation event. And even some people believe that, believe it or not, that there's a time where God is keeping us in the dark because other things were going on then. We know that in scripture, it talks about the war in heaven and that a third of the angels led by Lucifer, the most brilliant, beautiful angel ever who sang 
better than anyone or anything has ever sung before or again. He rebelled and God the Father threw out a third of the angels and that and they were cast to earth. That was a period of time probably during this time when the earth was out without form and void because Satan was already there in the garden at the time of the, the six day of creation account. So those are some of the things that I think about. And again, most people overlook those first two verses and just say, oh, the heavens and earth were created and then go on from there. Well, when I think about it, John, I realize that when you go from Genesis 1, 1 to Genesis 6, 8, you are covering a large amount of time. And we're not sure exactly how much time that is. Some people try and, and look at the various genealogies and try and determine a finite number of years, but I'm not so sure that's uh, an accurate way to interpret that. So going from Genesis 1-1, as Margaret said, from basically nothing to a point where Noah is really entering into the uh, Genesis account, a lot of things happen. Uh, so many things are happening, and we've got basically six and a half chapters of scripture to cover thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even more thousands of years that, uh, that there's really not much specific detail about what's going on there, other than, of course, the fall and things like that, that really set in motion the entire uh, story, the, the, the love story, if you will, the redemptive love story that uh, the Lord reveals to Adam and Eve in the garden, and then certainly uh, after they were deceived by the serpent. So there, there's just so much in there to deal with, but the promise, I think, that, that he gives to Adam and Eve that there would be a part of their seed, a part of their offspring, there would be a redeemer, if you will, or, or something that would come along, a, a, a part of their progeny, if you will, would actually come along and would uh, crush the head of the serpent, basically defeat death, even though his, his heel would be bruised, okay? That was kind of the, the first indication that there was something going to happen at some point in the future that was going to reconcile the problem uh, that they brought upon themselves when they disobeyed the clear word of God regarding not participating in eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, uh, as you know, uh, volumes and volumes that could fill libraries and libraries have been written on these first six cha uh, chapters in Genesis, but, but essentially it kind of opens up when we're talking about humanity being created, it really opens up the love story, if you will, that uh, begins with this promise that we have an opportunity at some point in time uh, in the future to get back in God's good graces. And um, that's kind of what I look at when I see it. But <laughs> there's so many other things we could go on for hours talking about them, but that's my initial uh, response to this question. Well, one of the things I know that we stress as a ministry is that we have a fully biblical worldview from Genesis to Revelation. And so one of the things that we need to be aware of as we look at the story of Genesis to Revelation is how we have three major points in that story. We have creation, we have the fall, and then we have redemption. And here in Bereshit, we get the, the first two parts of that three-part story. We get mm -hmm creation, the universe, our planet, the human race. We get the fall with Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. 
we see the promise of redemption or a very small hint at redemption, at least uh, with the uh, Genesis three promise, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And then the remainder of the biblical story is that story of redemption, returning to what was lost and the schism that they introduced by eating the forbidden fruit. And I know that all of us as you know, 21st century modern people, there are questions that we have about uh, the early Genesis chapters. And we wonder, okay, what do we do about the Bible? And what do we do about science? You know, what do we do about things like geology and astronomy and the speed of light and concepts like Big Bang and Darwin and all of this? And all of us, if we're completely honest with ourselves, have seen different groups of people, different theological schools try to reckon some view of science with holy scripture. Uh, and it ranges from, well, the Bible is my science book and everything has to fit into that from the Bible just presents a perspective of why we're here, but it doesn't tell us how we got here. And this is just a story. And so, there are those who think that, well, Adam and Eve are just a story. Uh, they just explain to us what the problem is, but, but we're not supposed to take it too seriously or, or that literally. And as we move ahead in the future, encountering some of these perspectives more and more is likely to be seen by people in today's Messianic community, particularly because they are as, as prominent as they can be in different more left-leaning branches of Protestantism, they're very prominent in Judaism, in non-Orthodox Judaism. Uh, and so that's something that we just have to recognize as an issue. But as Bible readers, you know, our intention is to, you know, what is God trying to communicate to us from Genesis? And I think mainly it's, you know, everything was good, and then something was introduced which made it not as good as it was supposed to be. And, and yes, there are the questions of, you know, as we learn later on in Holy Scripture, of this figure of, of Satan, this figure of the dragon. Uh, but really, the early chapters of Genesis are principally focused on the man and the woman and what they introduced. Uh, and, but yet, is it taking place within these wider series of events? So, uh, you know, I think we had some very good, you know, answers to this uh, question. So, moving on to... Uh, question number two, uh, Genesis chapters one and two describe the creation of the universe and of humankind. Uh, I think everybody can agree on that. Uh, describe how you have seen various Messianic people address these matters. So this is experiential. Uh, and do you think there are any improvements which need to be made? And it is, after all, the year 2020, the year that God is supposed to give us all, you know, 2020 vision <laughs> for what that means. Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's most important to recognize that we absolutely believe that God, literally, I think that the, the literal nature of actually taking some of the earth, some of the elements of the created uh, earth literally the adam the dirt and formed adam out of that out of that material that he found there on the planet as it existed at that time i think it's it's imperative that uh, we as believers understand that that is an actual event it happened at some point in time and that and that from adam as the text goes on it indicates that he actually uh took a part of adam and formed Eve. So I think when when we think about that as as a a, a create creation event, it's it's absolutely imperative that we don't fall into anywhere near the evolutionary model that so many people will uh, try and bring into the conversation. And especially in a messianic congregation where we might have a lot of highly educated people with scientific backgrounds who who want to debate this subject whether we come from an evolutionary model that ultimately became what 
the, the early writers of uh, Moses, let's say, recorded there in Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, we, we are uh, very adamant about not falling into that trap. I mean, we're, we're going to stand very strongly on the absolute creation of Adam and Eve, and then the events. It's, it's not a fable. It's not just a, it's something, it's not an Aesop fable or something that came up out of someone's mind, but it's actually a recording of what actually happened as it was given to um, mankind, early mankind, to the early uh, progeny, if you will, of Adam and Eve. And I, I guess Adam probably passed it on to Seth, and Seth passed it on to his son and children, and et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, event that occurred in the garden is something that was passed down orally, I'm sure, orally to the generations as they unfolded. So I think it's important that for Messianic Jewish com uh, communities of faith to absolutely stick to that um, interpretation of, of what was happening. Uh, in our experience, at least as far as I can recall, we haven't been exposed to Messianic Jewish congregations that try and blend the evolutionary model with the creation model. So thankfully, we haven't had to get into those debates, but I know uh, because our outreach is, is designed uh, in many regards to try and, and help the Jewish people come to faith, many of them might be coming into assemblies from a scientific uh, academic background, and they may have been taught a, a evolutionary model, and they may have, they may have learned that in a reformed synagogue for all we know. We, I'm not sure exactly how they handle this in a reformed synagogue because I don't have that experience, but, but I think we need to be able to always kind of stay with the text and believe that this is God's immutable word and this is the way he wanted to communicate it to not only the people, uh, the Israelites as Moses was finally putting it in writing, but ultimately to us today, because if you said, we have to believe that God's word, his basic love letter to mankind goes from Genesis 1-1 to the end of the book of Revelation. And that is uh, how we have to look at, at this particular passage even today. It, it's, it's his word, and this is the way he's communicated, even as simplistically as it comes across he doesn't get into all the detail he doesn't talk about the neurons and the skeletal structure and he doesn't get into all of the physiology of adam and eve other than the fact that he grabbed something out of his side a rib if you will so i think it's best for us as uh, teachers and as and as people who follow the scriptures to to stay with the text and make sure that is an integral part of our walk of faith to understand this is the way God communicated it to us and we need to work with it as it is written. Well, John, I have had conversations over the years with Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers who wanted to talk about science and the Bible. And the first thing I'll say to them is the Bible isn't a science book, but there is science in it. And many of these folks want me to help them with the, you know, what about the theory of evolution? And I can very easily tell them that the fossil record does not show evolution. The fossil record shows animals encased and fossilized all at once, fully formed and in different layers and it shows no evolution whatsoever. I also am able to help some of these folks who are highly educated and have been brought up to think that the Bible is kind of a myth or kind of stories. And I'll say everything that we need is in there, but nowhere in the Bible does it say how old the earth is, even though people have tried to calculate that, but it doesn't say that. And the different days of creation as we say in English and yet the Hebrew word is yom which means period of time that scientifically 
those days or those yomes are in the perfect order of how what we see in the fossil record. We, we see them in that order. And so some folks have never heard that. And I've been able to get some people to, when they realize that this thing called evolution is a theory, no missing links have ever been found in the fossil record to show transitions from one form to another. The Bible even says that things change and adapt within their own kind. We see that with, with uh, different breeds of, of dogs, different breeds of, of uh, horses, The people can breed them and, and get better and better, but that's still a horse, it's still a dog. And we see it with, uh, with uh, people with different um, ethnic groups, get married, have children, and they have a, a, a hybrid, so to speak, of the two, the, the two parents. We, but they're still people. So if you can get people off of thinking that evolution has been proven, then they will be able to believe and contemplate that maybe there really was an Adam and Eve because without Adam and Eve and the understanding of the original sin, the sin of which we have to be saved from with the sacrifice of Yeshua, if Adam and Eve are not real, then why did Yeshua have to come and redeem us back? Well, it's kind of, let me just add this because I had an interesting event with my 93 year old mother this week. And I think when we go back to that account in the garden, and we realized that because of the disobedience that Adam and Eve did there in the garden, that we know the fallen nature that we inherited in Adam and Eve became a part of our human experience itself. And so here I was talking to my 93 year old mother who was being interviewed for an article, a school project from a university here in North Texas. And I know her faith is, is minimal, and, and I've been praying for her for uh, 45, almost 50 years now. And, and so as we got into this conversation, the young lady who was making this interview was wondering how her walk of faith matured over these 93 years. And of course, she didn't have much to say because she really doesn't have a walk of faith. So I was literally able to take her through a, a kind of a gospel presentation, but the, the toughest thing she had to deal with at 93 years of age is the fact that she had a sin nature. She, she really didn't believe she had a sin nature. And I said, mother, this is, this is pretty elementary. We all have a sin nature. So I think the whole reason that we can go to those accounts in the garden and, and describe very specifically what our problem is, the problem we inherited from Adam and Eve. And for a lot of people, quite frankly, that's a hard thing to swallow. Most people don't consider themselves sinners, if you, if you can believe that. I, I think it's, it's almost mind boggling that you can get to her age or get to, get to 50 or get to 20 or get to 15 and not realize, oh, I am a sinner. But obviously, millions and millions of people have gotten to those ages and beyond and still haven't realized that they have a fallen nature because of what happened in that innocent place in the garden when disobedience entered into the human race. And so that was, that's kind of funny. I, I was reminded of that as Marty was saying that because by the grace of God, she got it. But boy, when she was getting it, her I have never seen her forehead so furled up and in, in twisted in knots as she was processing the reality that she is a sinner. But you know what? Now when I'm putting her to bed at night and we're going through our prayers, the first thing I remind her of is I say, now, Mother, who was it that died for your sin? And guess what? Tonight, she said, well, Jesus. And she, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it too complex for her. It's much easier for me to describe 
Yeshua as Jesus to her because she understands who Jesus is uh, much more so than Yeshua. But the point is, I'm going to reinforce that, uh, Lord willing, until the day she dies, because it's very important to me that uh, she'll, if she predeceases me, which is a good possibility, but you never know, uh, that uh, she'll be there waiting for me when I finally arrive in the heavenly realm. Well, this is a very, very big question for those of us in today's Messianic movement, because you know, we are uh, right now, as, as many are, people are aware, we're in a period of significant transition with this new decade. And as I contemplate this, this uh, inquiry, Genesis 1 and 2 describe the creation of the universe and humankind, describe how you have seen various Messianic people address these matters. Do you think there are any improvements that need to be made? I know that my experiences are very, very, very different than most people in congregational leadership and teaching and even some of the much larger Messianic ministries. Um, I don't hide the fact that I absolutely believe in a literal Adam and Eve who were created by divine fiat and not evolution. However, uh, when I was at uh, seminary, the significant number of my professors, I would say two thirds of the students I went with, uh, believed in some form of God directed evolution. Uh, and I have been exposed to uh, most of the theologians I consult believe in some kind of God directed evolution. And many of the Jewish people uh, in theology who I consult believe in you know, some form of evolutionary origin for uh, the human race. Uh, so I have been exposed to a lot of these ideas. And one of the things that I have to say is that I know that many of them come to these conclusions because they heard people who believe in some kind of hyper-literal view of Genesis 1 through 6, you know, Bereshit, who are not interested in any way, shape, or form with engaging with other perspectives. And they consider that to be somewhat arrogant. They consider that to be uh, a lack of humility. And it's like, you have it all figured out? Of course you don't have it all figured out. Uh, and so they don't want to be associated with people who seem rigid and, and dogmatic. And so then they turn to people who are scientists who will say, well, this is the evidence as we see it. And they appear to come across as being more intellectually honest, more humble even, like, well, this is just the way we see the way this data is taking us. And uh, whether any of us want to admit it or not, you know, the good news, the gospel message is believe on the Lord Yeshua and you will be saved. The good news is about Yeshua's sacrifice on the tree for our sins. It doesn't say believe on the Lord Yeshua and someone's interpretation of Genesis 1 through 6, and then you will be saved. The issues of Genesis 1 through 6 are more in that realm of biblical reliability and the different approaches that people have. And whether any of us want to be honest about it or not, there is a lot more diversity regarding Genesis one through six bear a sheet beneath the surface in our own messianic movement than leaders you know would confess to uh, i think if you were to have an open study and say okay what do you think about genesis one through six whatever you believe we're just going to put it out there on the table no fear of repercussions you know no fear of reprisal the good news is about believing in Yeshua. This is about Bible reliability. We would be really shocked to see what some people believe. Some people in leadership might not make it out of the, um, uh, the study without having taken a couple of pills or something. I mean, it, it really is, you know, that, you know, very concerning for me. But as we move into the future with more and more young people asking these questions, we have to see a significant shift in our messianic culture rather than you believe this or else move more to, okay, well, let's talk about these different matters. And 
okay, you know, you've heard people who, who hold to a quote unquote literal view of, of Genesis one through six, you are entertaining some other points of view. What are those points of view? Please explain to us why you came to that point of view. Please explain to us why you possibly think God used evolution. And no, I don't believe that God used evolution, but I recognize that there are people who believe that. And rather than dismiss them as being heretics on an issue that is technically not heresy, we might think that it is an aberration of some sort. But rather than dismiss them and see them pushed away, and then perhaps even ultimately pushed away from theism, the belief that there is a God, a supreme being controlling all matters uh, in the cosmos, I would like to rather see how did you come to these points of view? And was it because not of, well, a scientist you respected promoted this, but rather because of some really bad attitude and some dogmatic teaching or whatever that you heard from a congregation, you said, uh, if they're going to be this way about this issue, what are they going to be about issues that more directly affect me and my life? I've got to go someplace else where someone is a little more honest and a little more humble and they explain themselves a little better. I mean, I know these are uncomfortable things, but uh, as we move in the, into the future, I know recognizing that there is a plurality in our faith community is going to be vital so we don't totally lose young people. And I know for my own self, I mean, I haven't uh, you know, particularly heard in today's Messianic community, not that many people say, hey, you know, this is where I stand, but I know that there are other points of view out there. Let's not unnecessarily alienate these people because technically it's not a salvation issue. You know, the, you know, the, the apostles were not insistent that someone hold to some view of Genesis 1 through 6 in order to be redeemed from their sins. Uh, but I think theologians would and rabbis would concede that it pertains to how you approach the details as well as how you approach the reliability of scripture in general. And, you know, I am, uh, you know, as I move ahead in my own, you know, faith experience, uh, I have adopted more and more of a Jewish mindset. No question is off limits. Uh, if we don't discuss it, somebody else will. And that somebody will probably take somebody into atheism, as this subject matter frequently does, if it's not addressed carefully um, by you know, spiritual people. Well, John, I would add this. The one good thing about the Messianic uh, Jewish movement and, and the synagogue is every year they do discuss Genesis 1-1. They go through the Torah portions. They start with Genesis. The church does not do that. You can be in the church your whole life and not really talk much about, you might have a story about Adam and Eve, you might then talk about Noah, but they don't really get into Genesis 1-1 and go forward. And so that is one thing that we do have in our favor. We have to remember that as um, our children have science classes, that especially at the university level, that they will be mocked by their science teachers if they talk about the Bible at all. And unless they go to a, a Bible church, and if they go to a Bible church, they're probably not going to have science. So we have to be sure that we raise up our children to be able to withstand anything that will come down the pike in these end time days about the Bible is a fairy tale. You, it's, there's no, it, you, it doesn't match up with science. When I said earlier, it's not a science book, but there's a lot of science in it. And I also said those six yomes of creation are in the exact order that the is in our strata. It shows exactly that order. There's so much in the scriptures that are we are just now finding out that God really did know what he was talking about. It's not in, in Genesis that we get into the kosher laws. God always knew that with the kosher dietary laws that it was to not just have people obey him, but it, he had a reason. And as a scientist, one of the reasons is there's bacteria in food. 
There are worms in food. There are things that we didn't know back then until we had the microscope, the things that would hurt us. And that's why the things that we're not supposed to eat are scientifically proved now that are always in there. The, the sanitation laws, just on and on. So there is this kind of science in the Bible hidden away that God always knew what was best. But we really need to be sure that our children can ask questions and not be given a dogmatic answer. Like, well, the Bible says this and this is static and you can't question it. We have to be able to talk about it. We have to be able to take them out into the field and show them plants and show them the animals and go, go dig up some dirt and look at some rocks. It's all there and all wonderfully made by God. Well, turning to our final question uh, in this very you know, important episode of the Outreach Israel Report, because I, I know that a lot of discussions regarding Genesis 1 through 6 and the material, you know, they get caught on, you know, science, they get caught on, you know, how old is the universe, how old is the human race, but then we kind of forget, you know, what is actually taking place and some of the things that, you know, we're having to deal with as, as human beings, as, as to who we are, uh, because, I know that certainly when we you know, think about the, the later effects of sin and how we have to deal with this sin nature and, and, the, and this corruption and we have to reject temptation and, and we have to confess and all these kinds of things, we have a tendency at times to forget that God made man and woman as very special creations and that indeed uh, and this, of course, tie, can be tied into the whole abortion issue today. Human beings are of prime value to our eternal creator. Uh, so you know, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, describe Adam being made in God's image. So, and I know this has been debated and discussed for centuries, rabbis, uh, Christian theologians, etc. But what do you think it means to be made in the image of God? Well, obviously, we can look at it very simplistically and say, well, that means uh, God literally has two eyes, two ears, uh, a nose, and maybe he's got um, a couple of arms and legs. But I think, I think it's much more than just the physical attributes. And I, I think uh, one of the biggest things that uh, allows us to be created in God's image is he gave humanity a free will. In other words, each of, uh, pe each of the people who've been uh, born down through the millennia have a free will to choose life or death, if you will, as we get to the end of the, of the Torah writings there in Deuteronomy. We, we get to actually make a choice. And a lot of, a lot of that choice is because of our humanity and because of that fallen nature that we've inherited, lots of times we're, we're blinded because we actually look at things from our own personal perspective and don't really get up into the heavenly realm, if you will, and look at things from God's perspective. So I think it's very um, unwise for humans to be so self-centered that they don't look at things the way God would look at them. And so in that image that we have been re that we've been created, I think it's imperative for us to exercise our will and, and to a verse that I use often with different people as I'm trying to describe the challenges we have even today, even as even as born again believers, even though we've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit and we have you know, a measure of faith, we still, even after years and years of walking with the Lord, we still have some carnal issues that we're dealing with. And I, and I try and remind them that that's just, that's just a part of our humanity. The, I don't, we don't ever ultimately, I believe, eliminate any of that 
carnality that we inherited, we can minimize it. It can get less and less and less over time, but it's something that we, we have to deal with. So I, I kind of go to a very simple verse that Yeshua gave us there in Matthew in the, in the sermon, uh, you know, on the mount. And he, he says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. So I'm, I always encourage people, hey, it's a really simple thing. As human beings, finite little human beings, trying to understand an infinite God, we're never going to be able to plumb his depths. But we can always be asking, seeking, and knocking in order to expand our understanding of him, receive more instruction from the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. He's our comforter, but he's also the teach. He's going to teach us all things. And so that's just, to me, it's kind of emblematic of that, that image that we are as, as sons and daughters of God. I mean, there, there are scriptures that, that, that remind us that we are literally the sons and daughters of God uh, created in his image to ultimately be conformed to the image of his son, Yeshua. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a complex but sim simple way of understanding who we are in him and then who we're becoming as we move through time and approaching him um, in, in, along the way. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It means that we are special in his, in his eyes, that every person who's ever been born is in his image and has value that any baby unborn has value in his eyes and so that we need to look at each person as precious in his sight i think that's one reason why i am very pro-life i can't imagine um being anything else i think the most the safest place for a baby should be first in its mother's womb, and then it's in its mother's arms. And if we can see the value of life because God made us in his image, I think it would take care of a lot of ills in this world. We certainly sh should be aware of how the issue of humans made in God's image is a significant component of biblical ethics and our morality. Every human being, uh, whether they are people who we directly associate with or not, have value. And that's why murder is considered to be so abhorrent in the scriptures. Uh, later on in Genesis 9, uh, you will hear about how God considers murder of another human in his image to be so abominable. But as it concerns, you know, the human person himself or herself, you know, being made in God's image is a status that the animals don't possess. Animals are not made in God's image. And when you think about what animals do, you know, animals have, you know, things that are hardwired into their psyche you know, the need to eat, the need to get exercise, the need to protect themselves from predators, the need to procreate. Those are the kinds of things that animals have hardwired into them. Animals do not, for example, have complicated memories that they carry with them. Animals cannot, for example, uh, produce artwork or architecture or literature Animals can't do that. They can't produce music. Those are the kinds of creative abilities and skills that only humans have. Only humans can have complicated memories of talking to other people, communing with God, communing with nature. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that's very commonly lost when we uh, consider what it means for humans to be made in God's image. Uh, later on in Psalm 8, uh, uh, it, David uh, communicates, Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5, what is man that thou dost take thought of him, and the son of man that thou dost care for him, 
yet thou hast made him a little lower than God and dost crown him with glory and majesty. That's the 1977 New American Standard. Um, it doesn't say here that humans were made a little higher than the animals. It says that they were made a little lower than God. And I have to admit, the Septuagint rendered that as a little lower than the angels. But nevertheless, the lot of humans is cast with beings or entities of another dimension. So we, unlike the animals, have a connection to another dimension. And there are all kinds of ways we can take this. Uh, certainly as believers who believe ourselves to be you know, filled up with the Holy Spirit, we've got a connection to God in heaven. Uh, but also uh, it, it, it concerns matters like what happens when we die and what happens to that essential core human person? Uh, does that just go into nothingness or is that at least stored in some other dimension until the future resurrection? Very, very important questions are raised from uh, Genesis 1 through 6. And, and I know that a lot of debates take place regarding creation, evolution, the age of the universe, that sort of thing. But there are actually some much more, you know, hands on the ground, you know, feet on the ground uh, things from Genesis that commonly just get skipped over. Like all of us made in God's image, all of us possess value. And, and I know that when you can really grab a hold of humans made in God's image, you should be able to respect other people a lot more, even if they are unredeemed sinners, because it's not just enough at times to recognize that, well, Yeshua died for that person, and then I'm going to move on. But to remember, that person has abilities that have been given to him or her by a supreme creator. And, you know, I know that, you know, there are people in life we don't really care for, we don't really like, oh, you know, what about, you know, him? What about her? Uh, and then we go off and we play with our pets as though, oh, Rover, oh, buddy, oh, you know, whatever, you know, whatever we call our pets, uh, you know, Fluffy. But Fluffy was not made in God's image. Fluffy just knows how to eat, sleep, and mate, basically. Uh, Fluffy can't create anything, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, appreciable value. Uh, and, and, I, and I know that, you know, you know Genesis 1 through 6, Bereshit has a lot for us to think about. And at least in my experience, I have seen too many Torah cycles begin and end with these matters not sufficiently probed enough. That's right. Well, it, it, let me just make this comment. As it, it reminded me um, that because God had a, has a will and he willed the created order into being, you know, let there be light. And he just, he got the whole ball of waxing throughout the entire universe. But he also, in the creating uh, Adam and Eve from the, the dirt of the earth, he literally then in the Adamic covenant, he actually gave us a couple of things. He wanted us to, to multiply and have dominion over the earth. And, and he gave us authority over the, the, the animals and over the fauna he, he, and the flora. And he, he, he basically gave us far superior intellect. And as you were saying, memories and all the things, all the creative abilities he endows in individual uh, humans with the ability to, to accomplish what he set us in motion to accomplish. And it's been thousands of years in the making. And here we are in the year 2020, and we're still required to follow those, that initial uh, created mandate that we were, we, were, we were given in the garden to not only continue to populate, but also to take dominion over the planet and ultimately, as Israel in particular was raised up to bring the light of truth to the nations, then we know that was all a part of his redemptive uh, process for these humans that he built because he ultimately wants to have fellowship with us 
for eternity. I mean, if you, if you think about what a, what a incredible thought that is, is God has allowed all of these humans to be uh, multiplied down through the millennia, and he's going to have a multitude of people who have had faith in Messiah and what he accomplished at, at Golgotha and are going to believe on him, and we're going to be able to spend eternity in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Now, that in and of itself is mind-boggling to think that we have been given that incredible gift of eternal life in his presence. Mother, do you have any final thoughts? I think that uh, starting out the Torah portion with Genesis 1-1 is very important and it sets the tone of the rest of the year to know how important it is that God created. He created the earth, he created the heavens, and he created us for his purposes, for us to go out and love with his love as we share the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah to all who will hear, especially now when there are so many signs that we are in the end of the beginning of the end times. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that I know that you're very much aware of, this discussion is not over. Uh, in fact, I would say that this discussion is just beginning. Uh, but on our episode today, we have put some things out there on the table uh, for you to be thinking about, and we know that we will have uh, future episodes of the Outreach Israel Report, Messianic Insider, uh, other uh, broadcasts and podcasts where we will be discussing different aspects, uh, further uh, components uh, of these different subject matters, because it's something that's, I would say, for today's Messianic community, very long overdue. And just for you to be aware, we are going to be moving, and this is just a matter of information, toward a much more pluralistic messianic community when it comes to different perspectives of the material in Bereshit. And how are we going to deal with it? Uh, some people are going to handle it okay. Some of it are going to handle it not very well. Uh, and ultimately, what it comes down to is that we are entering into an increasingly more complicated world. Technology allows us to access information and different perspectives much more easily, and that we cannot be simple or naive to think that, well, if you're at this congregation, this fellowship, you must believe the same thing. Uh, I think we all know when you go to a Messianic congregation or fellowship, not everyone there believes that Yeshua is God. Now, we believe Yeshua is God. We even think that's a salvation issue. But I can't explain to you why I believe Yeshua is God unless I engage with some of the perspectives of those who don't believe that he's God and recognize that, okay, these people hold to certain convictions, and this is why I think they are in error for holding to those points of view from the text. And when it comes to a diversity of Genesis perspectives, which it's not a salvation issue, it might be a reliability issue. I, I, for me, want to hear these people out and find out why'd you come to this conclusion? Why did you, uh, you know, what do you think about this, this, this information? So rather than come across as being dogmatic or controlling, you enter into some kind of a conversation and you can maintain their attention long enough to say, well, this is why I disagree and let me explain to you. That's not often how we see the issues of Torah portion bear a sheet addressed, but it is something that's going to have to emerge as we uh, enter into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, on behalf of my parents, Mark and Margaret Huey, myself, John McKee, we would like to sincerely thank you for your continued offerings and donations, helping us help Messianic people all over the world. You can sign up for a regular contribution at outreachisrael.net 
forward slash support. We'll see you next week with another episode of the Outreach Israel Report. Until then, be sure to check us out online at www.outreachisrael.net.